So why don't we get started? Good evening. Um, I'm George Hall, and this is lecture 13 of a fiscal history of the United States. Um, last class, we discussed, a, we discussed the funding of the Union efforts during the US Civil War. Recall that after the war, the US repaid the Union debt in full, and US credit passed a critical test. We argued that this episode set the stage for the US dollar to become one of the world's dominant currencies 50 years later. So in, in this, this evening's lecture, I wanna talk about the funding of the next major war the US participated in, uh, the Great War or World War I. This war took place between 1914 and 1918. Uh, World War I engulfed the major powers in Europe. It devastated Europe and millions of people died in this war. It drained the coffers of Britain, France, and Germany, and shattered their empires. The US entered the war in its final year, and protected by the Atlantic Ocean, the US was left relatively unscathed. Now, this is not to say that the US did not make sacrifices. 115,000 US soldiers lost their lives, and another 200,000 were wounded. And the war effort ultimately cost the U.S. roughly $120 billion in current dollars, which is about $1.5 trillion uh, in today's dollars. But these costs pale in comparison to the costs incurred by the European powers. Now, the war did place other financial strains on the U.S. There was a financial uh, crisis when the war broke out in 1914. And just seven years earlier in 1907, the Treasury and US banking system had failed to contain a financial crisis and a deep uh, recession occurred. But in 1914, armed with new tools, the, tre the Treasury is gonna definitely contain this cur the current crisis. Now, ultimately, the US exited the war more powerful than ever, while Europe exited the war exhausted and broke. And in the decade following the war, U.S. Treasury Secretary Andrew Mellon modernized the market for U.S. Treasury securities, transforming it into the market that we recognize today. The major European powers exited the war hobbled by enormous debts. Further large reparations and restrictions were imposed on Germany. Thus, the European powers were never able to regain their predominance in the world, and there was a remaking of the global order, one in which America attains monetary and economic supremacy. So that's our topic for today, and probably also uh, next week's as well. Okay, so our discussion begins in 1907. There's going to be a panic. We'll then talk about the 1913, we'll have the establishment of the income tax, of the establishment of the Federal Reserve System, and uh, in 1913 and 1914, and in 1914, the New York Stock Exchange. We'll have the second crisis in which the New York Stock Exchange will be shut down. So what about the panic of 1907? This, this, our story starts with a panic, with the first financial crisis. So recall that in 1907, we have no central bank as the second, you know, we had no central bank going back uh, since uh, 1830 when the second bank of the United States, the charter was not renewed by Andrew Jackson. So there's no deposit insurance. That's not gonna take, that's deposit insurance that on, a, on a widespread scale isn't gonna come into effect until 1933, but there'll be clearing houses. And I'll explain to you what, what a clearing house does in a second. But to think about a financial crisis, we have to just think a little bit about how a bank works. So just uh, recall, probably from a money and banking course you may have taken, or an intermediate macro course you may have taken, or one of your macro courses in your master's program, how a bank works. What banks do is they take deposits uh, that are payable on demand. They then make, make loans. So they borrow money from depositors and then lend that money back out uh, to creditors, to loans. Um, but in order to meet demand for withdrawals, 
they're going to keep a small fraction of their deposits on reserve. So they may they uh, take deposits, but they're not, and they're going to loan those deposits out, but not all of them. They're going to need to keep some uh, on hand um, in case you know, in order to satisfy uh, depositors' needs for when they want their money back on demand. Now, of course, because they only keep a fraction of deposits on reserve, banks are vulnerable to runs. That is that uh, depositors may demand more of their deposits than the bank has on reserve. Um, so no bank can kind of, you know, stand by on its own, or any bank that stands on its own is vulnerable to these runs. So what a clearinghouse does is it's an, it's an organization or a, an agreement across banks to, to sort of insure each other in terms of that in case there's a run on one bank, the bank can borrow reserves from the clearinghouse in order to satisfy uh, depositor demands for withdrawals and get through any crisis. Now in 1907, there were uh, organizations called trust companies. Uh, trust companies were like banks. They, they did a lot of the things, same things banks did, but they, the one thing they didn't do was they didn't issue currency and they were generally not part of, the, of any clearinghouse system. Uh, they were generally part of a shadow banking system. And part of being part of the clearinghouse system, you're gonna have some regulations to be part of that. And so one of the advantages of being a trust company was you didn't have to face those regulations. But the disadvantage was you weren't part of this clearinghouse system, and so you were vulnerable to runs. The Knickerbocker Trust Company was the second largest tr trust company in New York City. And in the fall of 1907, there were concerns raised by losses in copper speculation, particularly by the bank president and some of the senior executives of the bank, of this trust, this trust uh, had, had lost a considerable amount of money speculating in the copper market. And so on October 22nd of 1907, there's a run on the Knickerbocker Trust Company. In the first two hours, they ended up having to pay out $8 million in deposits and to um, and they, they ran through all of their reserves and ultimately had to close their doors. Uh, this contagion and distrust of trust companies spread to other trust companies and other banks, and many other banks and trusts had to close their doors and suspend convertibility. Likewise, many regional stock markets closed. Now, since there's no central bank, somebody needed to step in, and in response, J.P. Morgan, along with the U.S. Treasury, and John D. Rockefeller tried to step in to uh, uh, stop this uh, spread of this panic. In particular, what they did was they, they played the role of what a modern central bank would do. They reviewed bank books, they decided which ones were solvent, and to those they made loans. Um, to those who they decided weren't solvent, they let those fail. Um, and they convinced banks to try to pool their resources to help each other out. However, even, you know, you think even JP Morgan and the Treasury and the Rockefeller um, uh, um, didn't even have enough resources to hold back the tide. And, and there was, a, in reaction, there was a sharp contraction of the money supply which ultimately led to a severe recession. And to think about how a, uh, a banking panic leads to a sharp contraction in the money supply, let me just give you a, remind you of uh, some things um, uh, that, that remind you of, of basically how, how fractional reserve banking works and how it leads to a money multiplier. So the money supply Remember, uh, think about like M1 consists of currency held by the public and bank deposits. Whereas the monetary base, or what's known as high-powered money, is currency held by the public plus reserves held by banks. We'll denote currency as CU and bank deposits as DEP, and then reserves as RES. If we take the ratio of these two equations, we get the ratio of the money supply over the base. So that's currency plus deposits over currency plus reserves. 
Um, and then this ratio can be rewritten. If I divide through on by both sides by, by the level of deposits as, as the currency to deposit ratio, or the ratio of currency to deposits plus one over the reserve to deposit ratio plus the current currency plus deposit ratio. And if you think about it, the currency deposit ratio gets determined by the public. So as a public, as a, as a public, uh, as a uh, money holder, you decide how much of your money do you want to allocate to currency and how much of it do you want to hold in the banks. And that, that's what determines the currency to deposit ratio. Banks, however, determine the reserve to deposit ratio. They uh, take in a certain number of deposits and they decide how much, what fraction of those deposits do they want to hold in reserve and how much of those deposits do they want to, what fraction of those deposits they want to lend out in loans. So we can write this uh, equation as, as the money supply equals this fraction um, times the monetary base. And this fraction uh, currency to deposit ratio plus one divided by the currency to deposit ratio plus the reserve to deposit ratio is known as the money multiplier. And if these ratios are stable, then um, you know, for every change, in, then the ratio between the money supply and the monetary base will also be stable. And under a fractional reserve uh, system in which banks hold only a fraction of their deposits in the form of reserves, this money multiplier will be greater than one. However, in a banking in a banking crisis or a fiscal or a financial crisis, these ratios will not be stable. If you think about it, when there's a loss in faith in the banking system, well, what's the public going to do? The public's going to decide to hold more of their wealth in the form of currency and less of it in the form of deposits. That will increase the currency to deposit ratio. Banks in expectation of higher levels of withdrawals, a higher demand for withdrawals from, from their depositors will hold a larger share of their deposits in the form of reserves. So in a banking crisis, we'd expect both the currency to deposit ratio and the reserve to deposit ratio to increase. And if you do just a little bit of calculus, it's not hard to take a derivative on those, you'll see that an increase in either of these ratios will decrease the money multiplier. So thus, uh, the, for the same level of the monetary base, the money supply will fall in a, in a banking crisis. And this is what happened in, in 1907, that loss of faith in the banking system uh, reduced the money multiplier uh, and uh, ultimately reduced the money supply because there was little, little uh, opportunity to increase the monetary base. We had a very inelastic uh, currency, which I'll explain in just a minute. Now, if you want to stop a banking panic, what you want to do is try to uh, keep people from changing these ratios. So what you'll want to do is provide loans to solvent banks and shut down insolvent banks. This will increase faith in the banking system and it will in encourage people to keep a larger share of their uh, wealth in the form of deposits and to to minimize their withdrawals from banks if, if they have faith that these, the banks that are open are solvent. Secondly, you want to increase the monetary base. You want to just simply print more cash. And the problem is, is at the time in 1907, we had a very inelastic currency. It was very hard to increase the monetary base. Most of the money took the form of, most of the monetary base took the form of gold and silver coins and certificates, national bank notes, you know, uh, notes, you know, uh, issued by, by national banks, and then U.S. notes, those, uh, those greenbacks that we discussed uh, last class. So it was very hard to, in, in time of crisis, to uh, print more money or to issue more money, issue more currency, uh, at a time when the money supply is, is decreasing. So in response to that, uh, to the, to the, Panic of 1907, there were sort of two, respo two responses to try to increase the elasticity of the uh, currency to allow you know increases in the money supply in times of 
financial crisis. So the first uh, was the creation of an emergency currency, the Aldridge Breland uh, emergency currency, uh, named for its sponsors, Nelson Aldridge, a uh, senator from Rhode Island, and Edward Breland, a congressman from New York. And what it was was that a, they created $500 million in a currency that was sort of held in vaults that could then be issued to banks in time of a, a time of crisis. These currency would be, would be backed by commercial paper and municipal bonds. The second thing that was done was the establishment of the Federal Reserve System in 1913. The Federal Reserve is not going to go into operation until 1914. So at the time of the outbreak of World War I, the Federal Reserve is still getting, uh, is still just getting set up on that. Uh, we could spend a class or we could spend a course discussing the uh, Federal Reserve System. We'll, we'll keep that brief here on that. Let me give you a few key dates on, on World War I. I'm just going to give you three dates. Um, if you want a, uh, a more full discussion, uh, it's a relatively brief, uh, Hugh Rockoff's uh, uh, chapter that I circulated uh, earlier, uh, an hour or so to, earlier today, has a nice uh, summary of the war and has a more complete listing of, of the dates. The reason I list just three dates is I want to note that the war starts in, in 1914, but the U.S. doesn't enter until three years later. And even though it, it declares war uh, in 1917, it's gonna take many months before uh, a critical mass of you know, US soldiers uh, is able to uh, enter the fighting and make a difference on the battlefield in Europe. It's gonna take many months. And so US soldiers are really involved in the fighting in any, in any significant way for only about a year. And then the war ends, uh, the fighting ends on uh, November 11th, 1918. Uh, so, the US, you know, for three years, uh, the European powers are fighting this out before the US ever enters. Now in 1914, there's, there is a financial crisis and this time the outcome is going to be quite different than we see in, than we saw in 19, 1907. So the war begins on July 28, 1914. So in the summer of 1914, the U.S. is on the gold standard. The U.S. is also a net debtor. So foreigners hold about $6 million, $6 billion in U.S. assets, whereas the U.S. holds only about a billion in foreign assets. Now, with the outbreak of war, the first thing the belligerents want to do is basically cash out of their U.S. holdings and repatriate them back uh, home in order to buy uh, supplies to finance the war effort. And so they try to, they want to sell U.S. holdings and then convert, convert uh, their holdings to gold and bring that gold back to their home country. Both the government and finance is very much worried about bank runs in this. And there's a really beautiful description of this period. I'm gonna give a very brief discussion of this period, but if you'd like, a, like to read more about this, uh, perhaps over your winter break, there's a really nice book uh, by William Silver of the Stern School, When Washington Shut Down Wall Street, The Great Financial Crisis of 1914 and the Origins of America's monetary superpower, monetary, I'm sorry, America's monetary supremacy. Now to stop the gold outflows, the treasury secretary at the time, William McAdoo, is what he's gonna do is he's gonna encourage the New York Stock Exchange to close in that new way to stop people from selling stocks and, 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 ca and cashing out their US holdings. Um, so the stock exchange is going to be closed from July 31st, 1914, and not reopen until November 28th. He's then going to disperse the, this emergency currency, uh, the Aldridge Freeland currency, in order to stem any uh, uh, stem any sort of bank runs before they they start. And then the third thing he's going to do is is to convince 
uh, the European powers that, in, that, okay, you know, it's fine if they go and sell their, their U.S. holdings, but instead of taking those, those holdings back and repa repatriating them back to their country in the form of gold, to instead to take, take the, you know, to sell those holdings and instead, instead of taking gold, buy U.S. agricultural goods, particularly corn, wheat, and cotton, and bring the, to repatriate their holdings, but to do it in the form of U.S. goods, agricultural goods. And in particular, way he's going to do this is, is help pay for the insurance. He's going to heavily subsidize uh, the insurance for, the, for shipping this. The outcome of this is that the U.S. is going to be able to remain on the gold standard throughout the war. It's a, he's going to stem, there's this, there is going to be a financial crisis, but the crisis is not going to spread to the real economy. It's not going to turn into a widespread banking uh, crisis, though the U.S. stock market will be closed. Um, and the U.S. will be able to maintain, stay on the gold standard throughout the war. In contrast to Britain, who's going to, who's going to have to impose uh, rather substantial controls on gold during the war. So there's a picture of uh, Treasury Secretary William McAdoo looking rather dapper in his office. Now, one of the interesting things about World War I is that Treasury Secretary McAdoo has basically three years to try to figure out the financing of the war. He knows the war has started in 1914, and he knows that there's a pretty good chance that the U.S. is going to enter the war. And so he has considerable lead time, unlike, uh, you know, say, Solomon Chase uh, during the U.S. Civil War. And uh, William McAdoo wrote a, uh, a very nice memoir uh, later in his life called, uh, uh, um, called Crowded Years. And in that memoir, he, he talks about what he does, about, about his thinking uh, about how to finance World War I during these, during these three years uh, prior to the U.S. entry. And one of the things he does, he goes back and he, he studies Solomon Chase's financing of the Civil War. And it's kind of funny. He says, he, says I, he goes back and he reads all the old Treasury documents, about what they did. And he said, I didn't really learn what to do. I learned what not to do. He's highly critical of Chase's uh, financing the war early on with short-term debt at high interest rates. He says, doesn't want to make that mistake. He also, he also while he credits uh, Jay Cook for selling the bonds, he says that's, uh, he says that's, we, we shouldn't outsource the marketing of a treasury debt to a third party. He's, he's quite critical of that. It's interesting, in his, in his studies about how to finance a war, there's no mention of Gallatin. Though it's, uh, it's interesting, he's going to, in the end, he'll follow a policy that looks an awful lot like Gallatin's policy. We'll also see some elements of state contingent debt as well. Well, he, he, he recognizes, first of all, that you know, there's no chance of being able to borrow from abroad. You know, the typical, who would you borrow from abroad? Britain, France, they're not going to lend to the U.S. They've got their own financing needs. And so during this three-year period, there's a robust debate about how to finance a war and about, about war finance. Um, Hugh Rockoff uh, has a nice summary of this debate in his chapter. So the chair of the Senate Finance Committee argues debt financing. He argues for largely a Gallatin policy. J.P. Morgan chimes in and says taxes should not exceed 20% of the total revenue. So he's basically debt financed the war, 80% uh, total revenue. There's a session at the American Economics Association meetings of sort of many of the sort of leading economists at the time. And it's interesting, they, they advocate uh, to basically primarily tax finance the war. Uh, uh, McAdoo, on the other hand, he, he comes out initially saying it should be 50-50, 50% taxes, 50% debt. Later, he's gonna, he's gonna change that recommendation to one third taxes, two thirds debt. So he's gonna do something that is much more uh, Looks like Gallatin slight ratios. The argument at the time, it's interesting because the argument at the time is very much that, that you should tax finance a war, very much in contrast to Gallatin. Uh, 
Uh, some argue that higher taxes would control inflation, that it's a way of, that if essentially, if, if output is fixed and output equals the sum of private consumption plus investment plus government consumption, uh, if the government's going to consume more, then the private sector is going to have to consume less, and it'd be better to convince the private sector to consume less through higher taxes than to try to bid up the price of, of various goods that both the private sector and the government wish to buy. Um, so sort of more interesting, and actually it seems the more dominant argument about tax financing of war is, is, was one about fairness. Uh, most of if you in reading much of the uh, discussion at the time, much of it is, uh, is argues about, uh, is, is much more about equity rather than, than efficiency. Uh, they argue that taxes would place a burden on those who could best afford it, so you could make taxes progressive. And it, the argument you hear several times is that, that uh, with borrowing, it's, uh, borrowing is very unfair to soldiers. So if you think about it, that a soldier drafted into the army would suffer doubly from borrowing because he's going to suffer once when he's serving in the army. And then two, when he returns, he's going to, he's not going to own any of these bonds. He won't have afford it. He can't afford to buy any of the bonds and he's going to be off fighting in war. And then he's going to come home to higher taxes to service the bonds of those who, you know, and pay back those that stayed. And that was viewed as, as quite unfair. And it's an interesting, interesting argument. And, and, it's easy to be sympathetic to that argument as well. Now, as you can see what, ha what ultimately did happen, expenditures rose dramatically during the war. Uh, receipts only rose, uh, you know, by much less. And so we debt financed, we largely debt financed much of the war. You'll see it ran a big, large deficits during the war and then ran surpluses for the decade afterwards. If you look at the growth in expenditures, you see that uh, you see the large spike in expenditures. One thing that's interesting about this, and it, you see the same pattern in in every war, and we've seen it in other wars, is not only does spending increase in for military expenditures, which is in the brown, but also expenditures increase for civil on the civilian side of government as well, which is in the blue. And then after the war, you see that you know, government expenditures doesn't return to its previous pre-war level. Government expenditures are permanently higher. Uh, we see this, that there's a shift up in, in the size of government, you know, uh, post-World War I relative to pre-World War I, and then it's higher, it goes up in the 1930s, and it's going to jump up again and be permanently higher uh, in World War II, as we'll, we may or may not get to in this course. Uh, revenues. Uh, you go, uh, increase some. What you'll see is, is that uh, the dark blue is, is customs revenue. And now in contrast to what we, we'd seen in the previous century, customs revenue now comprises just a relatively small share of total government revenue. Now most government revenue is in the form of internal revenue. And internal revenue is going to go up and increase during the war. And again, it's interesting in that you know, there's a permanent shift in revenues uh, after the war. The revenues don't fall back down to their uh, pre-war uh, pre levels. Uh, this is essentially the introduction of the income tax. And once the income tax get, gets introduced in 1913, income tax rates rise during the war. They come back down uh, some, but internal revenue now becomes a major component of, uh, of uh, government revenue and finance. So the income tax, um, one sec. Let me, I've gotten a number, a couple of good, really great questions. Let me uh, defer until the break uh, to answer, answer those questions. You feel free to, to uh, keep asking in real time, but I may, I, I'll defer until the break uh, to answer, but feel free to uh, continue to ask. As you as questions arise, thanks. So the income tax gets introduced in 1913. Recall we had the income tax first first got uh, introduced uh, in the U.S. Civil War, and then it was repealed shortly after the Civil War. Uh, 
the income tax was ultimately declared uh, unconstitutional, and a constitutional amendment was required to uh, to institute it. It got the income tax came into effect in 1913, and it was actually part of a deal, uh, the Underwood Simpson tariffs, that there was a it was part of a deal to reduce. Uh, there was a there was a reduction in tariffs that occurred in 1913, and in order to replace the revenue lost due to the tariff decline, they introduced the income tax. The corporate income tax that had been increased, introduced a few years earlier in, in 1909. What was also in play, what got put in place was the excess profit and the war profit tax, which got introduced during the war. It's kind of an uh, odd tax in that what the government did was for each company, it estimated what a reasonable profit was. Uh, it, it came up with an estimate for a reasonable profit and then imposed a rather high tax on profits that exceeded what they estimated to be reasonable. Um, it had sort of terrible incentives. First of all, it encouraged, uh, uh, you know, it discouraged companies uh, who could produce both consumer goods and, and, and goods for the war effort to produce consumer goods, because then they weren't war profits, they were consumer profits, so they wouldn't be taxed. It also, it also encouraged uh, firms to increase costs, so they, they would, a lot of, uh, there was a huge increase in advertising during this period, as, as firms decided that they would increase advertising to try to, uh, you know, engage in some marketing that might have benefits post-war. It also uh, increased uh, executive salaries as uh, you know, payment went to uh, executives rather than to uh, shareholders. Furthermore, it just you know, at a time when you need, when the government wanted high levels of output, particularly high levels of output for the war effort, to impose it, you know, and how, do you, how in a capitalist system do you encourage high levels of output? Well, you, you, uh, you promise high profits to encourage high output. Uh, to then impose taxes on those profits for producing, you know, war material uh, discourages exactly what you want the most. But there were some who argued very much in favor of this, and, and that unlike the uh, income tax, which was, you know, could could outlive the war, a war profits tax would would automatically go away once the war ended. I mean, once the war ends, uh, there's no there's no need for a war profits tax, so there's no way to define uh, a war profit tax. You rock off on page 18, I'll just cites that actually these taxes accounted for about 40% of tax revenue. It's actually a surprisingly large amount of revenue. They were quite effective in raising revenue. Um, just to think about the income tax, let me just, first of all, just sort of show you what an income tax, what the income tax looks like today. You'll see there's there's uh, seven different um, uh, tiers in the income tax, seven uh, different brackets, um, and and you can see that it's uh, the tax rate it's um, increases, the marginal tax rate increases as your income increases. Just thought I'd kind of show this for comparison, uh, what it uh, what taxes are look like today, and then let me show you what uh, taxes, what the income tax looked like, what marginal income tax rates looked like uh, in 1913 when they were first introduced. So you'll see that uh, there was just, whereas today we have seven in income tax brackets, when the first income tax first came out, uh, there were only two brackets, and the income tax rates were rather relatively low, just a, a couple of percent. And if you take a look at where they uh, hit, in terms of uh, the distribution of income, you can see that they're very much skewed toward hitting the very, very wealthy. So the, the, the dark blue line that's, uh, that are horizontal, let me just, this line here is the marginal tax rate. And then these, these vertical lines uh, show where uh, are the, are the show where uh, where different groups in the income distribution fall in the in their in their tax 
uh, along the, the x-axis in, in terms of income. So what you'll see is, is that, let me clear this. Um, so in, in order to be in the top one-tenth of 1%, one you need to earn an income at the time of about $400,000. That's in 2011 dollars, about $400,000. In, in 2011 dollars puts you in the one-tenth of 1% one bracket. To be in the top 1% of the income distribution, you'd need to earn about $80,000 in 2011 dollars. So you'll see that the income tax, and so for most, the average income filer, earned uh, you know, roughly about $10,000 in 2011 dollars. So the income tax is very much designed to target those, when it initially comes out, targets only the very wealthy and the, the very, very wealthy, uh, wealthy there. Um, in 1914, the rate isn't, doesn't go up much and not much changes. But by 1915, you can see incomes go up there. 1916, we start to see a rise in the income tax. 1917, then you start to see the expansion of more tax brackets and much more progressive progressivity built into the tax code as, as these, uh, these marginal tax rates start to increase and start to affect, uh, you know, they, they're still targeted toward the top 1% and one-tenth of 1% 1 in the income distribution. But they, uh, uh, you start to see higher tax rates. Now we start to see tax rates marginal tax rates of 10%, 15%, and the tax rates, higher tax rates are starting to work its way, work their way down the income distribution. By 1918, we see a multitude of, of lots of little tax brackets, but again, and uh, they're only gonna hit, you know, um, so the average income filer is gonna hit a tax, uh, income tax of about 7%, so income taxes, you know, for a tax that wasn't in existence just a few years before, that's a sharp increase in taxes. And uh, people in the upper income tax brackets are going to face much higher uh, marginal tax rates. Uh, and you'll see again, there, you know, many, many uh, tax brackets. It's interesting if you plot. This now plots from 1913 up until the present, the minimum marginal tax bracket, net tax rate, and the maximum marginal tax rate. Um, and what you'll see, what I want to emphasize uh, here, and we're going to talk about this a little later, is you'll see that during World War I, the, uh, the top marginal tax rate, tax rate increases sharply and increases up to to over 75%. In 1920, in the early 1920s, uh, Secretary Treasury Allen, Andrew Mellon is gonna, there's gonna be a sharp reduction in the top marginal uh, tax rate. And then, and then in the 1930s, that thing's gonna go back up as well. So there's gonna be, there's, there's a, uh, an episode here, which is gonna be a nice example of a sharp tax cut to the wealthy, very wealthiest Americans. We we'll wanna talk about that. But in order to finance the war, there's a sharp increase in marginal tax rates on the wealthiest of Americans. Just to give you some idea, remind you a little bit about tax moving. We run, so they run big deficits to finance the war initially, and then surpluses after the war. And despite all this talk about, you know, variety of ways to finance the war, whether it's with taxes or with debt, it looks an awful lot like Gallatin tax moving that we've seen before. We'll also see some examples or see some evidence of, of uh, state contingent debt uh, in a little bit as well. But it looks an awful lot like that. Now, so the, war, the U.S. enters the war uh, in April of uh, 1917. And one of the advantages of having three years to prepare uh, for the war and to, for financing the war is that uh, they're able to, they have legislation already uh, to go in order to engage in borrowing and financing of the war. So on just 20 days after the war is declared, Congress approves 
the first Liberty Loan. And in sharp contrast to the Civil War, uh, there's no expectation that the war is going to be short and cheap. Um, they can they can clearly they can see what's going on in Europe, and it's a brutal and expensive war. It's a war of attrition, and they know that this is going to be a long and uh, protracted, costly fight. And so there's an immediate move for long-term borrowing. No attempt to to do short-term borrowing on that. Um, the war is ultimately going to be financed by four Liberty loans. There'll be a fifth loan called the Victory Loan that will they'll take out after the war is over. Um, so these, these loans, there's going to be the first Liberty Loan, second Liberty Loan, and third Liberty Loan, and fourth Liberty Loan. They're going to be long-term loans uh, with different maturities. But, so the first Liberty Loan is going to be a 30-year loan, a 25-year loan, 10-year loan, 20-year loan. Uh, they're going to come out uh, in different ways, and we'll, we'll talk about them in a sec. You can see that the coupon rate is, uh, you know, starts off at 3.5%, and interest rates will rise throughout the war. From four percent to four and a half percent to four and three fourths, or the coupon rate, I should say, will increase throughout the war. The debt to GDP ratio will jump; had been steadily declining prior to the war. It will jump dramatically from from under five percent of GDP to up over thirty percent of GDP. It'll come back down. The debt to GDP ratio will come back down in the 1920s, and then rise once again in the Great Depression during the 1930s, and then really take off during uh, World War II in the 1940s. Now, it's interesting in terms of thinking about designing the Liberty Loans. Uh, again, McAdoo's got three years to figure out how to, how to design these bonds. And a lot of thought has been put into the design of these bonds. His goal, he says, is to minimize the cost of the taxpayer. That's what he's often, he wants to do. Furthermore, he wants to make sure there's no failed offering, which means that he wants to make sure that all of these bonds get sold. He doesn't want to rely on any short-term borrowing, and he doesn't want to have to uh, rely on any sort of uh, fiat currency, to issuing fiat currency. They're still going to increase the money supply some, but he wants to, he wants to borrow long-term, and he wants to make sure that these bond sales uh, succeed and that, that there's nothing like what went on in the War of 1812, where they they tried to issue bonds, but nobody came to buy them. Now, there's going to be a big debate during this period about whether to whether the interest on Treasury bonds should be tax exempt. Um, prior to the war, interest on the interest on Treasury bonds had been tax exempt, with the idea that you know why should it be that if the government's paying someone to paying someone to lend them money, it turns around and uh, taxes them on uh, on the revenue they get. Uh, you know, the government hands them, hands them uh, uh, returns for borrowing the money and then takes those returns right back in the form of tax, tax receipts. Uh, the problem is, is that given these tax rates and given the sharp prog pro pro progressivity of these tax rates, the tax exemptions were valuable to high income buyers. That hadn't been an issue prior to the war because the income tax was relatively, was either non-existent or relatively low. But the problem is, is that sort of low coupon rates make these bonds sort of less attractive to middle income buyers. And he recognizes, particularly also from the studying of, of the Civil War, is that he wants the middle class to invest in bonds. He wants, it, he wants bonds to be widely held so that after the war, the country would not, uh, he doesn't want it, to get into a situation after the war where he's taxing the poor in order to repay the rich. He says that that's going to be the case where we tax the poor in order to repay the rich. There won't be a political, um, cons you know, a, a political constituency for, for repayment or a critical, uh, he needs a, you know, a critical mass, a political majority to support repayment. And so therefore he wants the bonds to be widely held. He wants to align the interests of the middle class with repayment. There's also the concern, which happens in every war, and particularly goes back to the War of 1812, is that interest rates are going to rise. And so the concern is, is that for investors early on in the war, you know, who invest early on, uh, that interest rates will go up, the value of their the bonds will fall, and essentially the folks who come in later to invest in bonds will receive better deals than those who, who invested early on in the process. 
So they're going to have to deal with, with how to convince, convince potential investors to buy the first issues of the bonds, knowing that more bonds will be issued and addressing any concerns that the later folks will get, will get better deals. Um, what he's going to do is do something that's similar to what uh, Gallatin did in the War of 1812, which is essentially to say, look, at if, to, if you buy a government bond today and somebody later gets a better deal, you can get that better deal as well. So to do that, he's going to mitigate that risk. Government creditors, securities, you know, to worry, to mitigate the risk that, that securities would depreciate if rising interest rates later forced the Treasury to sell at higher coupon debt, the Treasury added, uh, made these bonds convertible so that if you, if you had a bond that had a 3.5% coupon and a later issue came out that had a coupon rate of, say, 45 you'd be able to convert your bond, your 3.5% coupon bond for a coupon bond that paid 4.5% coupons. And then to attract high income investors during the war, where there were very high temporary high tax rates, uh, they did make these bonds tax exempt. But then they also, but then also to try to sell bonds to the, to the middle class, they issued a, a bunch of uh, certificates of indebtedness or short term, some short term loans, things that would uh, used to be called, prior used to be called treasury notes. Now we think, they were essentially like a, like a, they were short-term loans. They paid a coupon to the, unlike treasury bills today. Uh, but they had a variety of tax provisions. Some were tax exempt, some were not. But in try to uh, sell some securities to those who, for whom the tax uh, exemption was, you know, was not of high value. The marketing of the Liberty loans is sort of a, is a interesting is an interesting story. Uh, clearly, the loans are going to be too big to sell to just the banks, and you're not going to be able to sell these bonds to foreigners. Now, McAdoo uh, says that he doesn't want to pay a Jay Cook-style middleman. He says there shouldn't be any third party, that the, the, uh, uh, the government should sell it directly to the people. And in his memoir, uh, Crowded Years, he states, we went directly to the people. And that means to everybody, to businessmen, workmen, farmers, bankers, millionaires, school teachers, laborers. We capitalized the profound impulse called patriotism. And this was the first, so instead of, uh, so Jake Cook also appealed to patriotism, but he also argued that it was a good deal. Here, they're going to organize fund drives in which, uh, you know, the Treasury Secretary McAdoo is going to become, is going to go out there and tour around the United States. And they're going to hold rallies in order to sell bonds. They're going to enlist the, uh, the help of celebrities to sell bonds. There's a nice uh, little example. They enlist the Charlie, Charlie Chaplin. We won't, chap, Chaplin we, won't, we won't watch the entire thing. I'll just show you. But if you want to have a little fun, there's a nice, uh, there's a nice, here's a nice little uh, short that was played before uh, movies uh, about different types of bonds. And uh, uh, by Charlie Chaplin, I'll just show you the, the different kinds of bonds. And it's there talking about the bonds of friendship and then, of course, the bonds of patriotism to fight a war. I'll let you watch that on your own, but it's, uh, it's good fun. Um, but like Jay Cook, McAdoo does take some notes from Jay Cook, and he's going to sell small treasury bonds and small denominations on installments, just like what Jay Cook did as well. Um, there's gonna be widespread advertising for these bonds. Uh, you know, invest your money with Uncle Sam, join the crowd, buy a Liberty bond, the safest investment in the world, pays three and a half percent and is non-taxable. There's a, uh, I'll send you a link to a nice collection of, uh, of uh, bond posters that's here at the Brandeis Library. Uh, Tom has a couple of nice, uh, has a couple of nice bond posters uh, that he can, he might show or display, put him on the spot. Now, the question is, though what's interesting is that part of why they have to go out and market in these bonds is, is essentially they're selling these bonds uh, at below market prices. They, 
you know, if, if, they're, if they were issuing these bonds at market prices, you wouldn't need to do a marketing campaign. You wouldn't need to enlist, enlist celebrities. So they're sort of selling these bonds, you know, it, it's sort of, uh, I'm sorry, at above, you know, uh, they're, they're selling them at higher prices than, than, uh, than at, at market people. And, uh, and when they go out and market these things, it, there's a, there is a debate about when they cross the line between patriotism and coercion. And if you take a look at some of these, um, uh, these, uh, these posters, and if you read some of uh, some of McAdoo's speeches, they definitely border on on coercion. You'll see it here. He says, "You know, shall we be more tender with our dollars than with the sons of our lives?" There he signs it, McAdoo, uh, William McAdoo, Tre Secretary of Treasury, buy a Liberty Bond, and then only buyers of Liberty Bonds can wear this button. So that if you buy a Liberty Bond, you get to wear a button. And there you can see that they're trying to put the pressure, where's your Liberty Bond button? And you know, there's the, the man looking down in shame, can't look Uncle Sam in the eye. Uh, and to, that to try to not just appeal to patriotism, but also to, uh, to sort of uh, shame those who don't, don't buy these bonds. Yes, I mean to sell that, that they're, I mean to say that they're selling these, these bonds at, at higher than market prices. So he's trying to, that, uh, that McAdoo is trying to drive the market price of these, uh, these bonds up by appealing to patriotism. It's interesting, if you look at the holding periods of these bonds, so this is the monthly nominal, nominal holding period of, on U.S. Treasury, on the portfolio of U.S. Treasury debt. Um, and you can see what's interesting, there's, rel there's relatively little Treasury debt outstanding for the war. You can see the, you can see the crisis of, uh, of 1914 when prices fall uh, by over 30% uh, as, as foreigners sell, sell U.S. securities and try to get their, take their resources back and repatriate their resources home. While the war is fighting though, it's interesting, it becomes clear that it, it's remarkably stable while the US is, is involved, engaged uh, militarily. It does seem like prices are, must be nearly fixed or there's some appeal to patriotism to keep prices uh, uh, within some control or in some bounds. And then returns, there's going to be a recession after the war in the early 19 in the early 1920s. Actually, a relatively deep. In, well, it's a deep recession, uh, and you can see returns are quite lar are largely negative. There. Um, actually, one quick question: What was inflation then? Excellent question. Let's get there. Uh, excellent question. That's exactly. So let's talk about inflation. So you'll see that inflation spikes during, uh, uh, during the war. It goes up, uh, you know, there's a, inflation exceeds over 20% uh, during the war. Uh, there's gonna be a sharp de uh, deflation after the war, but during the war, inflation, they run up, you know, it, it's a high, a very high uh, persistent inflation during the war. Consequently, since nominal returns are gonna be relatively flat and inflation is gonna be high, bondholders are gonna, you can see that bondholders are gonna receive low real returns during the war. And then immediately after the war with the deflation, they'll receive high real returns after the war. That's gonna look a lot like implementing state contingencies in returns. So you'll see again. This is just to see, in a you know, in a ta in table form, there's relatively steady nominal returns, but low real returns during the war, and then there's gonna they're gonna flip. So if you look, if you think of here, so here's uh, as the debt to GDP ratio grows, here's gonna be those war years. You'll see that. Um, uh, 
nominal holding period returns are, are low and steady, but because of the high inflation during this period, real holding period returns will be uh, are, are, large, are large and negative. After the war, however, you'll see that um, while nominal returns are relatively small, uh, inflation, there's gonna be a deflation and real returns will be large and positive after the war. So low, the bondholders will receive low returns during the war and high returns after the war. That looks an awful lot like the kind of returns that Tom showed uh, in his uh, uh, in that in that Python notebook uh, that he circulated earlier this week, in which he imposed returns into in, that when when the bad state occurs, bondholders get low returns, and then when the good state occurs, bondholders are repaid with high returns. Now there's another cost. Uh, that we, we don't take into account in this lecture, and that is the draft. I'll just note, it's kind of as a footnote almost, that, that 3 million men were drafted into the military at below market wages. So those are contributions that were made uh, that aren't you know, appropriately represented in the national accounts. Do that. Um, so we're going on almost an hour. So it's probably time to uh, appropriate time to take a break. So why don't I, uh, I'll stop here. Okay, thanks so much. Uh, we'll take a break and we'll start, we'll start back at, um, let's say uh, 727. Okay, see you then. <laughs>